Acts chapter number 18. Acts chapter number 18 as we continue uh, through the book of Acts. We'll look at Acts chapter number 18, starting verse 18 down to the end of the chapter. Uh, here we come to the final leg of Paul's second missionary journey. Uh, we find him in Corinth and he will soon depart from Corinth and continue through Ephesus and end up back in Antioch. But we're going to see that no matter where he is, he is continuing to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. We see him in Corinth and we know that, uh, well, the, the Jews there were trying to kill him and beat him and those things. Uh, God told him, hey, uh, while you're here, no man is going to touch you because I have many people in this city. And so we see, uh, we're going to pick up as Paul is uh, there tarrying in Corinth. And we'll see him soon leave. Let's begin reading in verse number 18. The Bible says, And Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren, and sailed thence into Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Centria, for he had a vow. And he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they desired him to tarry longer with them, he consented not, but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem, but I will return again unto you, if God will. And he sailed from Ephesus. And when he had landed in Caesarea and gone up and saluted the church, he went down to Antioch. And after he spent some time there, he departed and went over uh, all the country of Galatia and Phygria in order strengthening all the disciples. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man, and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the Spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them, and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And when he was disposed to pass in the Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much, which had been believed through grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly showing by the Scriptures that Jesus was Christ. Let's pray. Father, this morning, God, we're thankful for the opportunity we have to be in your church. God, I pray that you help me this morning. Recall the things that I've studied. God, help me to be clear in the message. God, hide me behind the cross. Help me not to say anything you wouldn't have me to say. Bless our time together. Would you say and pray? Amen. The first thing we'll notice is Paul uh, leaving Corinth. Paul had tarried or stayed in Corinth for a good while after all of the things that went down in the first part of chapter number 18 where Paul came to Corinth by himself. He met uh, Aquila and Priscilla and really God knit their hearts together. And uh, then uh, Timotheus and Silas ended up there in Corinth and Paul went into the synagogues and, and reasoned there with the Jews on this matter of Jesus and how Jesus was the very Christ whom they crucified. And then uh, the, the Jews, while there were half of them, or some of them that believed and were saved, there was another half that decided to, to, to uh, go before the rulers there, uh, Galeo, who was the deputy or the prince of Achaia. And the Jews went there to try to, to get uh, um, Galeo to intervene in the situation. And Galeo said, hey, if it has something to do with... Uh, some law that's being broken, whether it be murder or anything like that, I'll take care of it. But if it has to do with your law, you guys handle it. I, I, I'm not getting in the middle of this and delay or let Paul go. And then we see that uh, Paul was there and he, uh, they, they, they continued to try to take care of Paul, but Paul uh, was, was safe. And we see in verse number 10, the Bible says, For I am with thee, and no man shall settle thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in the city. Paul was safe there in Corinth. While most cities drove Paul out, the leaders in Corinth seemed to leave Paul alone. It's amazing how in almost every other city that Paul visited, they were trying to stone him or beat him or throw him out, throw him in, in prison, whatever they could do to silence the message. But here we see that the leaders really left Paul alone. 
Paul started a church there and saw much fruit, but he didn't do it through enticing words, but through the Word of God. In 1 Corinthians 2.4, Paul says this, In my speech and preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. And Paul said, hey, I didn't come to you using these big eloquent words that none of you understood so that you would come and just to see what I had to say. No, I showed you the Spirit of God moving and I used the Word of God to show you all of these things. When the pastor gets up, the pastor isn't here to entice us with words. Right? We're, not to, we're not trying to entice you with, with our charisma, right? Uh, you see different pastors, uh, they, they have different charisma. That's not at all what, what the point is. The point is to preach the Word. And that's what Paul did in Corinth. And, uh, he saw much fruit from it. We see that Paul sailed from Corinth to Syria, and he left from Centuria, which was the port there, and, uh, where he uh, shaved his head, for he had taken a vow while in Corinth. The vow he had taken was the Nazarite vow. And what was that vow doing? That vow, it was a special pledge of separation and devotion to God. Right? So he took this vow and it was usually made in gratitude to the Almighty for gracious blessings or deliverance. And in Numbers chapter number 6, God himself inaugurated the Nazarite vow while speaking to Moses where he said this, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, when either man or woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazarite, to separate themselves unto the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink, and shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink, neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes, nor eat moist grapes or dry. All the days of the separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree, and from the kernels even to the husk. All the day of the vow of his separation there shall be no razor come upon his head until the days be fulfilled, in the which he separated himself unto the Lord. He shall be holy and shall let the locks of the hair of his head grow. So Paul separates himself out. He is a living uh, a life that's separated unto God. The vow usually was for a specific period of time. Uh, whether it be 30 days or whatever that looked like, but some that took the vow were they took that vow for a lifetime, as in Samson. Right? That was a vow that Samson took for his entire life. And at the end of the specific time of this vow, there was a ceremony, right? And the ceremony included shaving off the hair that you had grown. In number 6, 13 through 21, we see the ceremony. It says this, and this is the law of the Nazarite, when the days of his separation are fulfilled, he shall be brought unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And he shall offer his offering unto the Lord, and one he lamb of the first year without blemish for a burnt offering, and one ewe lamb of the first year without blemish for a sin offering, and one ram without blemish for a peace offering, and a basket of unleavened bread, cakes of fine flour mingled with oil, and wafers of unleavened bread anointed with oil, and their meat offering, and their drink offerings. And the priest shall bring them before the Lord, and shall offer his sin offering and his burnt offering. And he shall offer the ram for a sacrifice, a peace offering unto the Lord, with the basket of unleavened bread. The priest shall offer also his meat offering and his drink offering. And the Nazarite shall shave the head of his separation at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and shall take the hair of his head, uh, the head of his separation, and put it in the fire which is under the sacrifice of the peace offering. And the priest shall take the sodden shoulder of the ram and one unleavened cake out of the basket and one unleavened wafer and shall put them upon the hands of the Nazarite after the hair of the separation is shaven. And the priest shall wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. This is holy for the priest with the wave rest and heave shoulder and after the Nazarite may drink wine. The, this is the law of the Nazarite who hath vowed and of his offering unto the Lord for a separation beside that his hand shall get according to the vow which he vowed so he must do after the law of the separation. So uh, here, Paul had separated himself unto the Lord. Uh, sometimes we must, we might not take the Nazarite vow, but we as Christians should live a separated life, a life that's different. So when people look at us, they see that we are not the same, right? We should be separated from the things of the world. Paul had separated himself unto God in, 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 in what seems like devotion for him, keeping him safe in the city of Corinth. We see that as Paul finishes up the vow, he takes and sails, and he, he doesn't go alone this time. He takes Aquila 
and Priscilla with him who would end up being uh, very big helpers in his ministry in Ephesus. We see in verses 19 through 21, Paul's time in Ephesus. The Bible tells us in verse number uh, in verse number 20, uh, verse number 19, and he came to Ephesus and left them there. Who is them? Them is Aquila and Priscilla. So he came to Ephesus and he, he left Aquila and Priscilla. And what did he do? He did what he always did. He went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. We've talked about it numerous times, but what was he reasoning? He was reasoning that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. That the, 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 what they heard in the, the temple every single Sabbath, how uh, when they read the law and the prophets, every time they heard Jesus uh, foretold in those law and prophets, this Jesus came to earth and he died for your sins and was buried and rose again the third day. That is what he came to reason with them. He was uh, showing them through the scripture that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. This is no new task for Paul. This is what Paul did every time he went to a city where there was a synagogue. He was there and he would, he would go into the synagogue. Notice another thing is that Ephesus wasn't just a, a, a city uh, that, it wasn't just a, just a no-name city. Ephesus was a, a major city. And so we, we see Paul's missionary journeys. Paul would go to all the different major cities. Right? He, he, he went to Corinth, and now he's in Ephesus. He would go where there was a lot of people, and he would start churches there. And what would those churches do? Those churches would go to the villages and start churches outside. That was the, 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 the model that Paul set for us through that early church. Instead of staying there in Ephesus as they're, uh, really they're pleading for him to stay, they're saying, hey, why don't you stay a little longer? Just just a little longer. Why don't you stay a little longer? Instead of saying he told him he could not stay any longer, we're going to have to get back to Jerusalem to keep the feast. Though we aren't sure if this has to do with the vow that Paul had taken or if it had to do with the timing of the weather uh, that would close the Great Sea until mid-March, we know that Paul couldn't stay in Ephesus very long. He had to get to Jerusalem. It's important to note, though, that Paul could have easily stayed in Ephesus. We think about all of the all of the persecution that Paul had gone to up to that point, it would have been easy for Paul to stay there in Ephesus. Because what happened? When Paul got to Ephesus, uh, we only see one side of, of reception for Paul. Normally we see two sides. We see those who agree with Paul and get saved, and then we see those who are against Paul and they stir up the city to try to tear Paul down. But here we only see those accepting Paul and accepting the message of Christ and say, hey, why don't you stay here a little while? So Paul could have easily said, you know what? We're going to stay here. We're going to make this base camp for a little longer, and we're just going to relax. But no, what did he do? He said, I can't. What is the lesson for us today? When God calls us to do something, no matter how comfortable we are, we must go. We can't afford to stay where God has not called us to be. We must continue to move on, and that is exactly what Paul did. Paul could have stayed in Ephesus where the people were hungry for preaching, and, but instead he was yielded to the Spirit, so when the Spirit told him to move, he moved. Then we see Paul reference God's sovereignty as he says this, I will return again unto you if God will. He, he knew that everything in his life had to do with one thing, and that was the will of God for his ministry. On that note, Paul left Aquila and Priscilla in Ephesus and sailed for Jerusalem. We see in verses 22 through 23, Paul reports to the church of Jerusalem and Antioch. When he landed at Caesarea, he went up and saluted the church. While Jerusalem isn't mentioned here, almost every time that Jerusalem is mentioned in the Bible, they're going up to Jerusalem, right? Because Jerusalem would be on, the, on a hill. And so we see that Paul comes and he goes up. And, and it's very likely that Paul stopped by and saluted that first church there in Jerusalem. Well, he was there, he likely did what he told the church at Ephesus he was going to Jerusalem to do, which was to fulfill the feast that he was going for. Then we see him go down to Antioch. He spent some time in Antioch reporting of what God had done through his second missionary journey. I can imagine the stories he had to tell. Uh, I, I think back 
to when he was talking about the unknown God there in Athens. And he, he's walking through the city there and he sees all these gods, gods to everything. The God of the sun, the God of the moon, the God of the stars. And he comes to, a, to, the, the, to the, the, the altar of the unknown God. He declared though that to those Athenians and many of them got saved. And, and I just think back to all the things that Paul saw on that second missionary journey. As he started by, uh, by strengthening the churches that he had started on his first missionary journey and went on. And here he comes to Antioch and he is uh, just reporting on those things. We see that he stayed there just a little while. He didn't stay long, but he stayed there long enough to, uh, to, um, to, to, to tell them what was going on. The Bible says, and after he had spent some time there, he departed and went over all the country of Galatia and Phygria in order strengthening all the disciples. As Paul did on the beginning of his second missionary journey, he went to the churches that, to strengthen them at the beginning of his third between verses 22 and 23, there is a distance of close to 1,500 miles covered. Think about, we talked about it last week, but think about all the miles that Paul covered in order to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. What a testimony of his willingness to do that. We see in Acts 15, 36 that Paul spent the beginning of his second missionary journey preaching the word of the Lord to the to to the churches that he had started on his first missionary journey. And then we come to Aquila and Priscilla helping Apollos in Ephesus. That's where we'll spend most of our time this morning in verses 24 to 28. The Bible says, And a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the Scriptures, came to Ephesus. We see that the story pulls away from Paul's missionary journey and, and brings into focus a man named Apollos. Apollos was a Jew born in Alexandria. Alexandria might sound familiar as we think back to when Stephen was, was preaching and, and was ultimately martyred. He was preaching to some Jews from Alexandria. Those in Alexandria had rights in the temple in Jerusalem. And so uh, he was, uh, they had rights that other uh, sects didn't have. We also notice that he was an eloquent man. He was well spoken. He 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 was he likely was taught in the best of the synagogues. He, he didn't come and just uh, he, he didn't fumble over his words. No, he was eloquent in his his speech. He was well spoken. He was mighty in the scriptures. He was likely taught in the best of the best synagogues. He knew, uh, he knew the Bible. He knew the Scriptures. Uh, he uh, was mighty in the Scriptures. He had somewhere along the way had a gospel encounter and was taught in the way of the Lord. We're not sure where that was. It could have been on Paul's missionary journey. It could have been uh, from one of the churches that Paul started that ultimately reached out to those, the, the villages around. But we know that he had a gospel encounter. Then we see... Uh, that Luke tells us that he was fervent in the Spirit. Paul uses the same word when instructing Christians how to be when he says this, not slothful in bi uh, business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. What does that fervent mean? It means like boiling. You're, you are fervent in spirit. You are excited in the Spirit. You are, you're, you're running over. You think about when you put a pot of water on the stove and what happens after a little while if you turn the stove on high? That water starts boiling and if you're not paying attention, that water will boil over. That's, that, that's what I think about when I think about the fervency that, that Apollos had. We need some Christians who are fervent in the Spirit. Who are stirred up in the Spirit. Uh, we cannot afford to have Christians being dead in the Spirit. We think about the way that our world is. We think about the way that our country is going. We need some Christians who are stirred up in the spirit to go and tell others about Jesus Christ. May I remind us this morning that no matter who is in the White House, if this nation doesn't have revival, this nation will end. May, may I remind us this morning that if Christians don't stand up, that this nation will die. No matter what. It doesn't matter who's in the White House. It doesn't matter who's, who's anywhere. What matters is that Jesus Christ is the only answer. 
the, the gospel is the answer to all of our problems. And here we see Apollos is fervent in the spirit. He's excited about what's going on. And we need to be excited about what God's allowing us to go through. You know, God has put us in this very time, in this very moment, for a purpose. And what is that purpose? That purpose is to live for Him. That purpose is to share the gospel. We talked about church on mission. What is the mission of the church? The mission of the church is the gospel. There is nothing else. We can have all of the programs that we want, but if those programs aren't centered on the gospel, they are just programs. They're not part of the church. The Bible tells us that Apollos spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord. We need to be diligent in our study of the Word of God. We need to be diligent in our in the giving of the gospel. We cannot afford to not be. It seems that his only flaw was that he only knew the baptism of John and didn't uh, he didn't know the baptism of Jesus, which was the Holy Spirit baptism. That, uh, which Paul is going to give him a little bit more knowledge of, and Aquila and Priscilla are going to take him and, and expound unto him as well. As he is preaching in the synagogue there in Ephesus, Aquila and Priscilla are faithful church members. We should all be Aquila and Priscilla, shouldn't we? We should be faithful to, to, to God's house, and we should be faithful to God's word, which we see both uh, in the life of Aquila and Priscilla. So Aquila and Priscilla, they could have easily just stood up and said, Hey, I've been taught by Paul, and what you're teaching isn't exactly right. Let me, let me give you a little bit of, well, let me tune the radio, right? No, but instead of what they do, the Bible says they take him to the side, and they teach him, and they, they instruct him in, uh, the, in the way of God more perfectly. One commentary explained it this way. They explained to him the rich fullness of the truth concerning the Messiah's atoning death and resurrection. They tuned in what was out of tune. Apollos could have easily ignored the tent makers. Who are these guys? Do they not know who I am? But what did Apollos do? Apollos took what they said to heart. He was teachable and took what they said to heart. Then we see that Apollos was disposed or inclined to go to Achaia. And then we see the brethren wrote exhorting words, asking the disciples to receive him there. Uh, apparently whatever was messed up, that he got it right. And they exhorted, they wrote exhorting words, asking the disciples to receive him. Then we see that Apollos mightily convinced the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. We can learn a lot from Apollos that we can use in our Christian life. The first thing we can learn is we should be mighty in the Scripture. This book is not dead. This book is very much alive. And every problem we encounter in our life can be solved by the Word of God. This book has all of the answers. It's the instruction manual. Right? How many of you, when you get something new, you look at the instruction book one time and say, oh, I got this. I'll figure it out. Uh, me too often. Just ask my wife. I got plenty of projects that I took the instructions and said, oh, don't worry. I know what I'm doing. We treat our Bibles the same way. We have the instruction manual, but we look at it and we say, okay, I got it figured out. No, this book is to be read every day. This book is to be diligently studied. If we want to be mighty in the Scripture, we must first read the Scripture and study them. The second thing we can learn from Apollos is we must be fervent in the Spirit. We must be on fire in the Spirit. The third thing we can learn is we should speak boldly about Jesus. We can speak boldly about Jesus because of who He is. Jesus has all power. Jesus knows everything. Jesus knows our every weakness. Think about that. He is still using us. We can speak boldly about Jesus as Apollos did. The fourth thing we can learn about Apollos is, or from Apollos is that we should be teachable in our Christian life. None of us have arrived. Right? I think about Dr. Barber. Many of you probably don't know Dr. Barber, but Dr. Barber is still learning things today. He's 90-something years old, and from just a few years ago when we were in seminary, he was telling us about his Bible reading that he does in the morning. And he gets up, and he can quote pretty much any, any chapter of the Bible. 
And he doesn't do it just so people will be like, oh my goodness, look what he can do. No, he does it because he's diligent in his study and he's teachable in the Christian life. He has never once arrived. And, and we have not arrived either. No matter how long we've been a Christian, we don't have all the answers. We must be teachable in the Christian life. The last thing we see that we can learn from, uh, from Apollos is that we should tell others the gospel. We have the answer to all of the problems. We have the answer to every problem that has ever existed in the world. From Genesis all the way through, we have the answer. And the answer is Jesus Christ and what he did for us on Calvary. When he died for our sins, he was buried and rose again. We have the gospel. Why do we not tell others? Apollos, he spent much time convincing the Jews and publicly showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. When is the last time that we took this book and showed someone about Jesus? I would say it's fair that most of us in here are believers. When is the last time that we took this book and said, hey, can I tell you something? We're all sinners. All of us have sinned. All of us are separated from God. There is none of us that can measure up to what God needs us to be to get to heaven. But there's good news. Jesus Christ came and died for our sins. He lived a sinless life first. He died for our sins, sins that he didn't commit. He was tempted in every way that we were and yet knew no sin. It is impossible for Jesus Christ to sin. And he knew no sin, yet he took the penalty for our sin so that we could have eternal life. He was buried in somebody else's tomb. And he rose again the third day so that we could have eternal life. He paid the penalty for our sins. That's what Apollos went and told the Jews. And that's what I'm telling us this morning. If you've never trusted Christ your Savior, today is the day. There is no other day. We are promised this moment and nothing else. Christian, this morning, would any of, of the things said about Apollos be said about us? Would people say that we're fervent in the Spirit? Would people say that we're mighty in the Scriptures? Would people say that we speak boldly about Jesus? Would people say that we're teachable in the Christian life? Would people say that we tell others about the Gospel? If not, we need to get it straight. We need to tune in what's out of tune. Let's all stand. We'll have a verse of invitation. we pray. Father, this morning we come to you humbly. God, we ask that you bless the invitation this morning. God, if there's one here that doesn't know you as your Savior, God, I pray they'd walk the aisle today and we can show them from your word how they can be saved. God, bless the invitation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.